sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. And once again, welcome to the back of the range. I am your host, Ben Adelberg. This is episode 114. Feels amazing to be back in the United States, but what an incredible experience I had in Mexico. As you recall, I attended the Latin America Amateur Championship at Mayacoba. Man, always great attending amateur golf tournaments, especially ones where the winner gets an exemption to the Masters and the Open Championship. So congrats to Abel Gallegos from Argentina, 17-year-old kid who hits it an absolute mile. I was following him in the final round, and you know, I'm seeing him hit this this three wood and just cuts this corner right over the water. And um, then I looked down, I'm like, nope, that was a hybrid. Okay, yeah, hits it a mile. You're going to see some fun things out of him at the Masters and the Open Championship. But um, before we get to this week's episode, just a couple things I wanted to share with you. So Mayakoba, the El Camelion golf course, it played hard, okay? I know when the PGA Tour players come into town, they tear it apart. The winner's like, you know, 20, 21 under. But the rough was up for these amateurs. The Hey, you know, the USGA is involved. It's, it's a major. It's going to be a tough setup. That being said, these players were put through the absolute ringer. Some of these fairways were about 20 yards wide, past Palom Greens that were very challenging. I saw so many missed five-footers, four-footers. The 36-hole cut was at plus 13, and the only player that finished under par was Abel Gallegos. But before you think these amateurs aren't that good, trust me, I didn't want any piece of this golf course under those conditions, and I'm not sure anyone else would want to either. On the other hand, if you're actually looking for a golf resort and Riviera Maya is not on your list, you need to add it now. The hospitality at Mayacoba was incredible. Friendly faces at every turn. I had some great meals at that resort. I actually got into Mezcal a little bit while I was there. Uh, yeah, just a little bit. But if you want some more information about Mayacoba, shoot me an email at ben at the back of the range.com. I can give you some additional information, and I might have a guy that can help you out with your travel. So let me know. Before we get to this week's episode, I know I say it all the time, but seriously, make sure you are subscribed in Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you're listening to the back of the range. You need to subscribe. Why? We have some absolutely incredible guests coming up in the next couple months. Like, amazing guests. Like, I can't believe he got that guest. That's how crazy it's going to be. So, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, and you'll know it when you see it. That's all I can say right now. I don't want to change it. You'll know it when you see it. Really quickly, some mojo updates. Congrats to Sahith Thigala and Pepperdine's men's golf team. They racked up the team title and the individual title at the Southwest Invitational. Sahith was on episode 101, one of the coolest guys in collegiate golf right now. And if you did not see how he finished the tournament, well, he won by a single shot. But after he hit his approach to 18 on the green, he pulled a Kobe Bryant jersey out of his golf bag and wore it as he tapped in the winning putt. An amazing tribute to an amazing athlete. Congrats to that entire team. I had the chance to speak with William Mao during the Road to Hoylake series last year. Joey Versage, he's a transfer from Nevada. He's a friend of the podcast. Going to be very interesting to see what they do for the rest of the spring. Congrats to Alex Smalley. He Monday qualified into the Waste Management Phoenix Open this week. He'll be making his first career PGA Tour start today, so good luck to him. You know, I spent some time with him at the Walker Cup. And while we do give each other a hard time every once in a while, because he's a dookie and I'm a Kansas guy, you, you, it's hard not to root for a guy like Alex Smalley. So good luck to him. Mojo is activated. Another cool announcement I have for you all is that I'll be attending the Valspar Intercollegiate at the Floridian in March. So very cool tournament. Looking forward to reconnecting with a few of the Walker Cuppers I followed last year or so. John Pock from Florida State, Cole Hammer from Texas, the Cootie Brothers from Texas, uh, Augustine from, from Vanderbilt, Andy Ogletree, the U.S. Amateur Chairman from Georgia Tech. Going to see all those guys. So I'll be providing coverage on site. Really can't wait to reconnect with those guys see, and see how those teams are going to fare at the Floridian. So keep that in mind. I'll be providing some more information 
as we get closer to that tournament. Again, make sure you're following on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The website, thebackoftherange.com, that's where you find every single episode. You can buy a towel. You can buy a hat. There's all sorts of information there. Make sure you go there, thebackoftherange.com. All right, I'm rambling. Let's get going. This week's guest is John Handrigan, head coach of the men's golf team at the University of Notre Dame. Now I know, when you think Notre Dame, you don't necessarily think golf. You think football. You think about the Gipper. You think about Rudy. Before we get to the interview, let me just get something off my chest. I'm sorry to go off on a tangent here, but if, but if you're able to watch Rudy, the whole movie, and not even get close to shedding a tear when the team puts you know the jerseys on the coach's desks and they want Rudy to dress in their place, or, or when he finally gets on the field and sacks the quarterback and they carry him off the field, if this movie does nothing to you, you don't even get close to shedding a tear, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. You need to go talk to someone. That's all I'm saying. Just you, you got to get in touch with your feelings. All right, let's get refocused again. So I've had the opportunity to speak with many college players and coaches here at the back of the range. Players and coaches from Texas, Oklahoma, Wake Forest, Oklahoma State, powerhouse programs, historic programs. But don't sleep on the Irish because in the fall of 2019, guess what team racked up four team victories faster than any team in the country? Yes, the Fighting Irish. So I talked to Coach Handrigan about his nearly 20-year journey to getting a head coaching position at the D1 level. He has bounced around the country. He was in D2, then at D1. He had, had a stint at Kansas, had a stint at Florida. But very interesting guy, very interesting what he did his first year. It wasn't all about, okay, we got to hit more balls and, and practice harder and we need to work on this. Um, it really was as simple as culture. It was as simple as changing a lot of the perhaps bad habits and bad traits on the team he inherited. So really eye-opening. We also spoke about the network of Notre Dame. That's incredible. But let me shut up. Let's get to the episode. Coach Handrigan, welcome to the back of the range. How are you? I'm doing great today. Thanks for having me, and I look forward to it. Well, uh, you know, we spoke earlier, and we're both uh, dealing with, uh, I guess, this this the the January flu cold season that's flying around the country, and uh, I'm dealing with it. You're dealing with it as well. We're going to get into a lot of things um, about your playing history, about your coaching history, because you've bounced around the country to different uh, different coaching stints. Finally, now you're at South Bend, but uh, let's get a little topical. What's the worst? Um, worst weather you've played in what's the worst uh, conditions you've played golf in just to kind of open things up on a on a casual note well i played golf at a northern school at st francis university and uh we weren't fortunate enough to travel to some of the nice places we get to now at notre dame so in the northeast we had to play most of our golf up in that uh, area and uh, there was one year we played our conference championship and we had to pause the round or delay the round because there was accumulation of snow uh, on the greens. So once they uh, they kind of got most of it off, we kept playing. But I remember uh, playing that conference tournament in snow. So that's got to be probably the worst one I've ever played. Yeah, and, and you've played professionally on the Canadian Tour and the Great Lakes Tour. And I'm just thinking of all these kids that come in to uh, you know the programs you've worked at, you've you've been you know you've you've had other uh, you know been in South Carolina, you've been in North Carolina, you've been in Kansas, you've been in Florida, and now you're at South Bend. But when any of your players ever complain about any sort of course conditions or anything that is slightly adverse, I mean, do you have to take a deep breath before unleashing on them, or like, or is it just like you have no idea what what tough conditions are? Yeah, sometimes I try to take a deep breath, but it's, it's, it's hard to as well because sometimes I just let them have it because they're they're treated pretty well nowadays, as you know, in college golf. And uh, and I think as coaches and our organization with the GCAA, um, every year it gets better. Um, and it's a, it's a joy to play in and be a part of it. But, uh, yeah, I've coached for 20 years now, and to see how much it's evolved in 20 years, it's, it's pretty impressive. I, I played two years at a small NAIA school in Miami, and I think my – hall as far as uh gear was a stand bag that didn't stand up very well um three shirts and then two hats and uh, we'd scrape together golf balls somehow but that was pretty much about it maybe a pullover i can't remember but you see these pictures of the gear that these these teams are getting uh, it's it's insane i mean I, it's it's incredible when you were playing at St. Francis, what did you get? Because it looks like we were 
kind of playing college golf around the same time, late nineties, early two thousand. What was what was your haul at St. Francis? I think we had three shirts per team, but we washed them every week. And if you uh, weren't in the lineup one week and got in the next week, you're wearing somebody else's wash clothes because we didn't have enough for the entire team. Oh, that's uh, perfect. Yeah, but I was lucky that I was in the lineup every tournament in my college career, so I had my own gear. But some of those other guys wearing somebody else's laundry was uh, wasn't pretty. So we uh, we didn't get much. And I remember my old coach, who was my role model uh, in in coaching. Um, he would give us one sleeve of balls per tournament, and uh, and it didn't go very far, that's for sure. Yeah, good luck with that. I've had that too. I think I had that in high school and college. You get like one sleeve, and you're like, all right, well, I'm, I guess if I want to finish the round, I'm hitting uh, three wood or irons off the tee just so I can <laughs> keep my equipment in front of me. Um, yeah, the golf balls got marked up so easily back then, and they didn't last very long, you know? Yeah, of course, of course. Well, I mean, you, you just alluded to You played your college golf at St. Francis in, in, in Pennsylvania, you know, uh, accomplished career, as you said, played every single tournament. You made the transition to play professionally um, on the Canadian tour. Tell me a little bit about, you know, I, I've talked to other people. Uh, I've talked to Dan McCarthy. I've ta- just had Brad Tilly on the podcast, both guys that played professionally. Well, well, McCarthy's still playing. Tilly's a reinstated amateur, but they were telling me these great stories about playing uh, PGA Tour Canada. Uh, it seems like the Canadian tour are playing professional golf in Canada. There's got to be a great story somewhere. So, Dig into the memory banks of uh, of the early 2000s. What do you got? Give me a good Canadian tour story. I don't know about a story, but I do recall that I was I was Canadian and uh, and grew up, but I just didn't travel very much. And as you know, the Canadian tour back then, you kind of traveled all over the country of Canada. Yeah. And uh, and I absolutely loved it because I got to go so many places that I'd never been before and experience what Canada was all about and the people there. Um, and although it was a short stint, I think I only played for a year and a half and on and off a little bit, um, so I couldn't really afford to do it. And I was working at the same time, but, uh, I enjoyed just traveling around Canada and, and I wasn't a top player and I realized it wasn't going to be my, my career, but, uh, to be able to do that with some of my close friends, you know, college buddies growing up, uh, sure. was a pretty cool experience. That's for sure. When you made the transition to coaching, was it necessarily a, this is my life career path. This is exactly what I want to do with my life. I want to, you know, mold golf teams. I want to, you know, get to the top ranks in, in, you know, NCAA. I want to, I want to coach a division one team. Did you have that mindset going into it? Or was this more of a, Hey, I'm in my early twenties. Um, I have an opportunity to go back to my alma mater and let's just try this you know what what was your thought going into coaching college golf uh it wasn't uh a career move that i thought at the time um we uh you know i was hoping to get my master's degree and i wanted to go back to st francis and uh, i wanted to be with my coach who was uh, struggling health wise at the time um so i was helping him out as a graduate assistant and at the time, you know, there wasn't much of a career for assistant coaches across the country. Very few schools had them. Yeah. So I didn't think of it as a career at that point in time. Um, but uh, I just enjoyed the competition and being around, you know, young players to help them develop. And uh, I just grew to really love it after a couple of years, you know, getting my, my uh, master's at St. Francis. And then I, at that point, I knew I wanted to make a career out of it. Um, but I didn't know which direction or how to do it. And, uh, and as you mentioned, I've kind of been – all over the country at so many different schools, you know, a head coach at division two level and then assistant coach at, you know, some pretty good division one schools and just built my resume. And it took me, you know, 18 years so far to, uh, you know, been coaching for 20, but been at Notre Dame now for, for two years. It took me that long to really fall into my dream school of Notre Dame. So it's kind of, it's kind of been a long process, but, uh, very rewarding to become a, you know, come to a school like Notre Dame. Yeah. Well, you have this, this, this long resume and these great successful stints at, at the schools you've been at, but I would be remiss if I didn't uh, ask you about this other entry on your resume. Um, Cause it, it definitely is extremely unique as far as uh, guests that I've had on the podcast, you know, college coaches, college players. Tell me about South Muskoka curling and golf club in Bracebridge, Ontario, Canada. This is the first curling reference in the history of this golf podcast how tell me about this place yeah and i have to say short story that i'm not a curler and i grew up and uh, it was part of our electives in in public school and my first time curling i actually fired the rock so hard that i cracked another rock (laughs) and i was banned from the curling rink so 
I, I wasn't a curler, but I grew up there, and uh, my mentor growing up was Ron Webb, and he was the head golf pro at South Muskoka. Um, he gave my first job there. I think I was in grade five, and uh, I was picking the range. It was the first job that I had as a kid every night, and I got to hit all the balls into yeah. you know, one flag. And, and he uh, kind of taught me the game, and he taught me the business. And I worked at his uh, golf shop, you know, starting in fifth grade and, and all the way until I graduated college. And, uh, and I owe him for where I am today because he uh, just really helped me out. He taught me, you know, in Canada, we didn't know much about the college golf process. So he helped me, you know, get a golf scholarship in, in college. And, and then, he, you know, he kind of steered me towards the, the coaching direction as well. So uh, I owe a lot to him, but it was, a, it was a great spot to grow up up in northern Canada. Yeah, that just sounds like a, a cool place. If you have curling and golf at the same place, that just sounds like, a, a, and I, I can't believe that as a, a a Canadian, you were banned from curling. Um, that's <laughs> that's uh, it's like a kid from California saying, yeah, you're not allowed to surf, so stay away. Um, well, I, I had to ask you about that, and, you know, you've, you've had this, this great journey around all these different schools and, you know, you're at Coker college in South Carolina, you had success there, you had success at Queens university in Charlotte, and then you make the jump. And now we get to the fun part of this interview. Cause we get to talk about the university of Kansas. I have, I was just in Lawrence, Kansas. I spent time at KU. I have family members that went to KU. What did you know about Lawrence, Kansas when, you get the call or that process started where you're going to be an assistant at the D1 level. Uh, what did you know about Lawrence, Kansas? I didn't know anything at the time. And uh, I just recently was married and I told my wife that, you know, I love division two and I've enjoyed working up the division two ranks and our team was probably ranked two or three in the country. And I said, it's just, it's not enough. You know, I want to get to the division one level. I don't think I'm going to get hired from being a head coach at division two. So I think the next step is to become an assistant at the division one level to get to my goal, which is eventually, you know, a top division one school. And I told her, you know, that the assistant job at Kansas was open. And uh, she's like, the only thing she said was it's a great basketball school, but I don't know about going there for golf, you know? Um, But I went there on a visit. And as you know, uh, being from there, uh, it is a, an absolute amazing place with a lot of good people. Um, and the golf program was solid at the time, but um, there's nothing like Lawrence, Kansas. The people there are great, um, great basketball school, and I hope to get back there someday. I still have some friends there, obviously, but it's a pretty special place and a nice spot to to start my Division One coaching. Well, and you started there, and then you, you know you went to Florida. You spent several years there as an assistant, then as the associate head coach uh, with with JC Deacon, and now you're at Notre Dame. And I I guess I want to ask you if you can speak to not just recruiting, but I guess the atmosphere at a big school that's known in athletics for a sport that's not your own. I mean, Kansas is a big basketball school. Florida, I think you actually can say basketball and football. Notre Dame, I know the women's side is strong in basketball, and obviously they're they're iconic as far as football goes. How does that play into your recruiting? How does that play into just maybe what it's like as a student athlete in a sport that maybe is not the most noticeable on campus yeah and i think in major division one athletics it's pretty rare to have a school that's uh focused or known just for golf Um, i think there are some out there but mainly if you're going to a top division one school if it's a high quality athletic department typically one of those power uh sports is probably you know well known for the university so i think it is rare and i think that's the great part about it because that creates the the culture and the atmosphere that i really enjoy you know i love going to basketball games i love going to our football games and uh and i think our student athletes love that too because pretty you know most golfers now um they're into other sports as well and they love being part of that atmosphere and and you don't want to be the only team on campus that's you know that's known to be any good and uh notre dame you know we got so many teams that are ranked in the top 10 in the country year in and year out it's fun to um get connected and get close with the other program myself i love to be around the other coaches and learn from them um, and our student athletes, they they get into the other sports, and uh, and then Notre Dame does a great job here of not isolating our sports. So our student athletes are mixed in with each other, and I think that's the best part of, of college that you're learning not just from your sport, but from all the other athletes that are you know top in their class or in the country. You were named the 2015 uh, Assistant Coach of the Year, and I'm you know I haven't researched how many assistants that win that award go on to full-time jobs, but I'm going to assume that 
if you're winning that award, a full-time gig has got to be somewhat next up on the radar for you. Um, when you won that award, was that around the time that other schools started calling? And I'm obviously not going to ask you to mention other schools that may have been recruiting you, but how do you go into that process of like, okay, I've worked so hard for this dream job. You know, I probably don't want to jump it just the first thing that comes along, I want to be a little bit, you know, selective with this. I'm the best assistant in the country, or at least I've been awarded a, a prize saying so. Do you remember what your thought process was at that time? Yeah, that award is a very prestigious award, but it's not just, um, you have to earn that award. So there's a lot of nom- nominations. Of course. And then it's the interviewing process. So you earn it by what you, your team does and what you've done over your career, but then you have to go interview through, you know, with many head coaches across the country who are on the committee, and they select kind of who is that, you know, who earns that award. So it's it's prestigious, and at the time when I won it, um, I thought that was going to be kind of my, my golden ticket, and it was, and it, it opened a lot of doors for me, and I had a lot of opportunities um, that weren't coming my way previously. But as you know, college coaching, it's a, it's a very tough market. There's a lot of great coaches out there. There's maybe two or three jobs that open each year. If that, sometimes there's only one and you get hundreds of of great candidates. So it's pretty tough to get your foot in the door. Um, But that definitely helped a lot. And, and after that, I had quite a few interviews and and that was my, you know, towards the end of my career at Florida and uh, had some great interviews with awesome schools. And, uh, and I was fortunate to land the job at, at Notre Dame, which had a, program that was struggling a little bit at the time and it's been very rewarding to uh be a part of turning this thing around so you get to south bend and you know normally i ask the coaches about you know recruits they bring on campus and how they get you know all starry-eyed at a football game or a you know a a midnight madness basketball game or something like that you know or just being on campus but i'm going to turn this around on you you know we're around the same age so we know you know the the powerhouse irish football teams in the 90s um how were you or what was it like being on being in South Bend for the first time on campus? Were you just kind of kidney candy store? Were you were you able to hold it together or were you just a little bit like, oh my gosh, I'm at North I'm at I'm at Notre Dame? Yeah, um I held it together the best I could, but I was fortunate their one of their core values here is family. So they invited my wife along uh, on the visit. So we were touring around campus together and, and meeting a lot of that the head coaches and seeing all the facilities and we even watched football practice and met Coach Kelly. And, uh, and it was very tough not to uh, show my excitement. And I think I had a smile on my face from ear to ear the, the entire visit. Um, and when they really focused on family and my wife, and, and it, was more, it was more than just coaching and more than just winning, um, I really felt that, like this was the, the right place for me. And, and uh, as you know, Notre Dame is a special place with a lot of great programs. Um, but just the, the national brand for Notre Dame and our alumni network has been outstanding and more supportive than uh, I've ever felt anywhere else. So they went after your wife just as much as they went after you, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And they just wanted to make sure that she was going to be part of everything. And, right. and that's a big part of what they do here at Notre Dame. It's not just me, it's a family. And, uh, and that was, you know, I went on a lot of interviews those the last two summers when I was looking and uh, it wasn't like that at, at most places I was going to, that's for sure. You come in and it's your first year and you lead the team to their lowest team stroke average in over three decades. You know, all these great accomplishments in your first year, these aren't kids that you recruited. They were there. I'm assuming most of them were there uh, already. So um, I guess just to ask the question bluntly, um, how'd you do that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, a couple of things we do very well here. It's not just me, but it's our, uh, it's our whole program. And my assistant coach, Scott Gump, as well, is uh, we really work hard at developing our players into great young players and, and young men. And uh, we changed the culture here pretty quickly. Uh, that first year, we, we talked very little about golf. We talked about, you know, character, um, how to treat people. Um, how to play the game, and uh, a lot of course management and work ethic, uh, changing their pra- practice uh, day in and day out. And we did a lot of changes that first year, and I owe it to our, our guys. They were open to that, um, and they worked hard. They did everything that we asked them to do, and it was great because they're starting to see the rewards from it. And uh, and we didn't accomplish everything we wanted that year, but we're pretty close. And uh, we were in the final group at the ATC tournament the, the last round, and for a team like Notre Dame from where they were the year prior, uh, it was an amazing accomplishment. I'm very proud of the team, what they, they did that first year. And then how far we've come, you know, in the two and a half years I've been here, it's been, 
it's been great. And I, I couldn't ask for anything more. You mentioned changing the culture. Um, I, I guess I want to ask you this, not just for what you did, but also something that maybe parents of juniors that are listening to this podcast uh, could instill in their kids or perhaps another coach or a high school coach. What is the one of the things in the culture that had to change? Something that needed to be flipped? You know, what is maybe what pinpoint one of those things so where people listening could say, okay, maybe I recognize that in my son or daughter, or I recognize that in a junior camp that I volunteer at. That's part of a culture that needs to needs to be changed. Sure. A lot of it at Notre Dame at the time was attitude and mindset and becoming a team rather than, you know, in high school golf is, uh, you know, it's more of a at top juniors in the country. It's more of an individual sport, but when you get to college golf, you have to know how to be part of a team and work well together as a team. You know, one thing that we talk a lot about, which was a, a problem our first year is that, you know, players wanted other players in the team to play poorly so they could get in the lineup. Mm. And we flipped that around because you want your team to play great and you have to play better for them to bring out your best stuff in order to get in the lineup. And that culture w- was a problem in the beginning that people didn't want them to play well because they thought that'd be easier for them to get in the lineup. Well, we, we changed that in our, in our culture and we got a team that uh, was some great leadership from some of our captains to, to really step in and, and help that culture, help that mindset of what competition really is. And uh, we have a positive competition environment where we encourage each other and support each other all the time and uh, and if you don't, if you're not part of that, then you doesn't matter how good you are, but you don't get in the lineup because you haven't quite earned that in our minds. And that, that has nothing to do with golf or skill level. That has to do with, you know, mindset and how you treat other players on your team. Yeah. Interesting. I, I would imagine that that had to be kind of tough to uncover that and see it firsthand where, you I mean, that doesn't sound like it's your, um, that doesn't sound like you at all. And you, you get to Notre Dame and you see that culture. I guess that probably what must have been pretty surprising when you first saw it. It really was because uh, obviously at elite programs and programs that are ranked, um, you know, like being at Florida for a long time, that's not usually an issue um, right. because they've gotten that level and they've really understood what it takes to be successful at that level. Um, but here it, it wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't important um, when I first arrived and we made sure it was important. And, and the guys in the team will vouch that, we, we didn't really talk a lot about golf that first year. You know, we, we, we talked about culture all the time and character more than we talked about anything skill wise with golf. And that was what turned it, uh, our program around quicker than it was focusing on golf. And, and once we instilled that over two years of time, this is the first year that we really focused on goals that are related to performance. All the other goals were related to culture and character. Um, and now we're focusing more towards uh, performance goals because we have, you know, the bottom part of the peer pyramid in place with a great culture. You and you have to have that. Yeah. yeah. You got the foundation. You have to have that first before you can excel at the highest level. And we have a great foundation and now we're, you know, we're top 10 in the country for the first time ever in school history. So we feel like we, uh, we're heading in the right direction for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're ranked, I believe seventh or eighth right now in golf stat. And, and there's, there's all sorts of different rankings, obviously, but yeah, actually, you know, firmly in, uh, firmly in that top 10 you had four wins this fall first time I think first team in the country to get to four wins so that's incredible um, so let's talk a little bit about the, some some hard truths you have a great practice facility with hitting bays and, and track mans and indoor facilities but uh, the weather today at South Bend is 40 degrees and that can't help when it comes to recruiting and when it comes to hitting off of grass forget about recruiting but hitting off of grass so let me ask you, how do you compete? What is Notre Dame, what can Notre Dame offer that, you know, can drag some of these top recruits from going to a Florida or going to an Arizona state or something like that? Uh, what are maybe some of the things that you realize were at your, um, you know, in your arsenal, so to speak, for recruiting uh, when you're trying to get these top guys to, uh, to Notre Dame? Sure. That's a, a great question. And uh, like you mentioned, we have a great facility and it's a great indoor facility, but there's nothing like playing golf off the grass and you have to play a lot in order to compete against the best schools in the country. Um, so, you know, there's a, a thought that Northern schools aren't going to perform at the highest level because they don't have that. Um, and that was a concern for me, but the best part of Notre Dame is the brand of Notre Dame. 
and uh, and we play. I wouldn't say we play as much golf as a school, you know, in Florida or in the South, but it's pretty darn close. And we have such a great brand that every Thursday afternoon after we're done classes on Thursday, we fly to some nice part of the world and play golf, you know, all day Friday, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday and come home. We're getting in probably, you know, three or four rounds minimum every week. And there's not one weekend that we spend on campus in the wintertime. We are traveling everyone because we feel like we got to play a lot of golf in order to compete with the best. And, you know, our, our guys get back on Monday of next week, and our first practice trip is going to Augusta National for oh, the weekend. Get out of here with this. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, we were getting along really well here, and I was just about to lead <laughs> you into this, and I was like, all right. I was like, I knew you were going there, so go ahead and, um, and you know, bolster your recruiting uh, um, needs right now and, and really make a lot of people jealous. Um Tell me about some of the places that your kids have been to in the fall, because you just mentioned Augusta National. And um, I, I think if I remember correctly, let's see, uh, Seminole. Correct, which is, I think, in the top 10 in the country right now. Yeah, it's it's right down the street from me. And uh, every time I try and crash the gate, they, they turn me around. Um, so you got Seminole, and let's, let's see um, – uh, you played MacArthur down here in West Palm Beach. Yeah, which is a really great private golf course in West Palm. We get to play there a few times a year. Um, absolutely love it. So we're fortunate there. Well, you have my phone number now, so there really is no excuse that I don't get these phone calls when you're in town. So I'm glad we've gotten this squared away. So playing Augusta um, now. So let me ask you this question. You got to go to Augusta with your team and you are the head coach. You're the responsible adult on this trip. How hard, I mean, how hard is it for you to not run around and be a kid there? I am a kid there, 100%. Okay. Okay. And I wish, I wish I could say I'm not a kid, but I am, I'm around. You know, I try to do as much as I possibly can. I go to every cabin I can. I'm taking as many pictures as they, as they allow me. Okay. Um, most times I don't even know it's my turn to hit because I'm usually watching, you know, at the look at the golf course and the scenery and just uh, – the atmosphere of Augusta National is amazing. And, and I've been there several times because we have quite a few alums there at, at Notre Dame. So um, my two and a half years, I've been there, I think, three or four times now with uh, some members. So it's pretty fortunate. But every time I go back there, I'm always uh, I'm always shocked that I can be invited to a place like Augusta. Who is – now, let's – let's you've been very, very complimentary to, to your team and your kids in the program. But, but give me a good story about one of your kids that just couldn't – just didn't know how to act or just couldn't calm down and just play golf when they're at Augusta national. I mean, there had to have been some story of somebody just not handling it, not in a bad way, but I mean, just someone that just was just too overwhelmed for the situation. I think that was me. The oh. first time we went with the team, I was so overwhelmed that I, I was even clued in, but I was playing uh, or, or one player, uh, John Felito was playing on the group behind me and, uh, and we're playing, you know, the, the tournament tees, and he actually made six birdies in, in 18 holes. And I and I was so in awe of the golf course and watching him, I couldn't believe how well he was playing. But that was his first time playing. I thought he'd be a little nervous. Uh, but he made six birdies in 18 holes at Augusta, which is pretty cool. So did you know, um, not to veer off into Augusta National Land, but it's just too easy to talk about Augusta. So did, did you know that you were going to have access to these trips before you took the job? What or or how does that come to be where you get told that? And can I have the name and phone number of who sets that up? So I no, I'm just kidding. Um, but how? Okay, so so yeah, explain how that gets mentioned. Like, oh, by the way, um, this is going to happen. Well, when I was interviewed for the job, they kept talking about the Notre Dame brand, and sure. uh, and I knew it was I knew it was powerful at the time, but I was just coming from Florida, which has which has a pretty powerful brand too. So yeah. I didn't realize the significance of the brand until I got started in an interviewing process and, and I, and I knew I really wanted the job and the, all the phone calls that I received from prestigious alums that play golf at Notre Dame or just people that are connected with the program. And then I started realizing that this is extremely special and there's people all over the country and world that want to help out our golf program. And, and the first thing I did when I got the job is I wrote a letter to every person that was connected somehow to our program um, just to welcome them back to Notre Dame golf and to get them connected to, to our program again and the support that we've received. And I'm not talking just financially, but right. you know, going to these golf courses 
And every tournament we go to, there's always, you know, three or four alums in the area that are inviting us over for dinner. And sometimes I, I, we can't go to every one, but we try to incorporate everybody to one dinner. And uh, it's something that I've never really experienced before. And in Notre Dame, it's, it, it's, a, it's a different place. When, when people leave here, all they want to do is give back and uh, when, when they leave. And it, it's special to do that. And I know other schools have that, but uh, I haven't experienced it in my time. And it's, it's fun to be a part of. And, and all these people that are, you know, that graduated from Notre Dame that are in the golf, into golf, and, and they're members of some great courses, um, we're fortunate that they invite us to those places. And uh, that's why we do these practice trips on the weekend to, to get us ready for our winter, winter golf season. But, but also it's a networking for our, our student athletes. They get to meet some of the great great alums and, and people um, that graduated from Notre Dame. What, uh, what was the first, uh, or tell me about the first time you met Jimmy Dunn. Yeah, well, I, I just received an offer and I accepted the offer for a job. And, and when within the first hour of, I, of my acceptance, he called me and uh, he said, Coach, the first thing we got to do is arrange a time for your, your team to come to Augusta. Oh, dear and God. And I said, Mr. Dunn, no problem. You pick the time, and we'll make sure it works in our schedule. So and that was the first time. And then uh, he was here for a, a football game early um, in uh, when I started here at Notre Dame, and we connected pretty well. And since then, we played a lot of golf together, and uh, he's helped me with quite a few things and a lot of introductions to people within the you know golf industry and in the Notre Dame industry. So we've uh, we've hit it off, and. Uh, and I was just, uh, you know, played a lot of golf with him over the winter time. So he's a he's a super guy and a great asset to our program. Yeah, yeah. I was fortunate enough to meet. Uh, there's uh, when I was at the Walker Cup uh, earlier. When I was at the Walker Cup in September, I got to meet uh, him and Buddy Marucci and um, and Spider Miller. And uh, oh, nice! And That's a great group of guys and there. And there's, and there's a candid picture that my pal Dan McCoy took when. Uh, so it's the two of us there and. Uh, I was kind of doing the the on camera and the interview stuff, and he was kind of my support and and was phenomenal with what he did because he made everything look and sound really great. But he captured this this completely candid photo of me talking to I think Mike McCoy, Spider Miller, Jimmy Dunn, and Captain Nathaniel Crosby. So that's one of my favorite pictures from uh, from that uh, experience. But very uh, cool. Yes, yeah. a great group of guys you're surrounded by there. Oh yeah, that that was that was a lot of fun. Um, well, I, I'm going to get you out on a couple, just a couple other questions. But the thing I wanted to ask you about is um, you just had the, the 2019 U.S. Senior Open at your home course, the Warren, the Warren course there uh, in, in South Bend. It's the first time it's a, been ever, U.S. Senior Open has ever been held at a collegiate course. And I'm guessing you and your team, I know you did a lot of stuff with the USGA as far as, you know, uh, some content for their social media channels and I guess you and your team probably are the most knowledgeable people um, in the area on that course. So did Stricker or Langer reach out or, or, you know, tell me a little bit of what that experience was like um, for your players, for you, for the university, having a, having a major championship there. Yeah, it's the first uh, major championship, <clears throat> excuse me, they've ever had at a col- on a college campus. So um, it w- we were fortunate to have it. Um, it was well in the mix before I got here, so I wish I could take the credit for it, but it uh, had nothing to do with me. Um, our golf staff here and, and John Foster, our general manager, did a great job with bringing that tournament here uh, to Notre Dame, but uh, we got to reap the rewards of it. You know, we, I had three players off our team, caddy um, for players that uh, uh, were playing in the event, so that was pretty neat. Um, we had a skybox just for men's golf. Um, and we brought all of our former uh, players back and alums um, to come for the event. And uh, just the recognition, um, you know, telev- on television, it was filmed uh, or on TV, in, I think 70 countries across the, the world. So uh, yeah. we got a lot of recognition. It's helped recruiting. Um, and when you can help tell a recruit that we're the only school to ever host a major championship, it speaks volumes for, for our golf course and the quality of it. Um, so yeah, we've been fortunate to have it. It's, uh, really helped out our, and, and jumped our, our program quite a bit. Well, you, uh, like I said earlier, you, you had four wins in the fall. You're getting ready for the spring. You're, you're in the top 10. Um, what are the things you're focusing on, uh, for the spring? You got the national championship, uh, going to be in Arizona this year. You know, you have a lot of, uh, tournaments, uh, you know, between now and then, but, um, what's, what's one thing you're kind of focusing on, uh, for, for this spring? Yeah, our, our team um, is very focused. They're driven. Um, we keep it very simple. Um, we try to get better every single day. We keep our goals all process goals and what we're going to de- do each day. 
And if we build off of that, I think uh, we're going to have a very a good result towards the end of the year. Um, golf is a funny game. You can't control what other teams do, but you can control what you do. And, uh, and like I said, we keep it simple every single day of practice. Um, I'm looking forward to the spring because we take some some awesome trips, like I was talking about every every weekend, and get to play some some pretty special places. Um, never mind our tournament golf. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a great spring. I, I have a really strong group of guys that uh, you know. It's gonna be sad to see some of the a couple of the seniors leave, but we have a great team that care a lot about each other, um, support each other all the time, academically and athletically. And it's just it's fun to be around. I enjoy it, and uh, and we're gonna gonna go to a lot of great places and, and play some competitive golf and, and get better. And and we're not content with winning four to the five in the fall. We our guys want want more, and we're gonna keep pushing until we get that next uh, that fifth win. Sounds like uh, some some great insight that uh, you know people that are working on their game, whether it be other schools, uh, you know, mid ams. We have a lot of people from all different walks of golfing life that listen to the podcast. So. Coach, I definitely appreciate you joining us here at the back of the range. I know we'll be following uh, the Irish, and uh, I'll be waiting on my invites when you come down to South Florida every weekend. And uh, <laughs> good good luck the rest of the way, and thanks for joining me here at the back of the range. Yeah, thanks very much. I enjoyed it, and uh, always excited to talk about college golf, and we appreciate your attention to that and uh, help promoting our, pro- our uh, program and, uh, and college golf within our, our country. And there you have it. Special thanks to Coach John Handrigan from Notre Dame for joining us this week. Great insight into that program. Can't wait to see what they do this spring. Don't forget, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Go to the website, thebackoftherange.com. Don't forget to subscribe in Apple Podcast and Spotify. We have some amazing guests on deck. But for now, we'll see you again next week for another episode here at the Back of the Range.